blockchain is, I would say, not only a technological revolution, but first and foremost, a socio-economic revolution. Blockchain is a tool to bring us into a more decentralized world. Why can we disrupt organizations with blockchain? In order to understand this, we need to understand the history of the internet. So if we look back, the first generation internet, early 90s, revolutionized information. And this is why we called it the information data highway. About 10 years later, we had the so-called Web 2. The internet became more mature, more programmable, and all of a sudden we had, on the one hand, social media platforms, and on the other hand, a peer-to-peer -peer economy where the consumer and the producer came closer to each other of information, of opinion, of goods and services. So the original vision of the internet was to be a decentralized world where everybody could put information online. But in the Web 2, it became very centralized with those platforms. It brought us this peer-to-peer -peer economy, but with this huge man in the middle, this platform in the middle, who started to control all the data and dictates the rules of the transactions of that platform. So instead of the internet becoming more decentralized, it became more centralized. And what we're doing now with blockchain and IPFS and all these other technologies of the decentral web, we're redesigning data structures given the fact that we are already living in the connected world. And if we think of blockchain in the context of the internet, it is the driving technology behind the decentralized web, or also called the Web3. You could say that it's like a decentralized world computer. It's a distributed network of computers. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network. The protocol could be seen as like the operating system where you can now run decentralized applications or smart contracts on top of it. So we're reinventing not only the internet, but also the computer. It's very important to understand that this technology is very early on in its development. It's kind of like 1990 when it comes to the internet. It's more or less 1960 when it comes to hardware. peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the middleman and it all started with Bitcoin. Two people who don't know and do not trust each other sending money from and to each other without a trusted third party in the middle. So it all boils down to one question of trust. It's a protocol that decentralizes trust and instead of a central party verifying transactions, instead of one single bank server verifying transactions, the transactions are verified peer-to-peer -peer in a democratic way by consensus and it's all done automatically. The computers in the network do that automatically. It's not people behind it, it's machine consensus. So this is highly disruptive. This machine consensus allows us to have peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the middleman. And the heart of this machine consensus is the smart contract. So the smart contract is just a piece of code running on top of a blockchain that codifies the rules of a transaction. And when the rules of the transaction are met, the transaction is automatically executed. And that's highly disruptive because this reduces transaction costs of compliance and enforcement because compliance and enforcement happens on the fly. So if you think of a chess game or a football game, you always have rules of a game you have a chessboard manager, a referee, who makes sure that the players to a game can only make moves according to the predefined rules. And this is the function of a smart contract. So what smart contracts do, they disintermediate in a very radical way and allow us to have these peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Basically, we can use smart contracts for any industry. So it started with Bitcoin, money without banks, sending money from A to B, but you can have apartment sharing without Airbnb and Wimdu. You can have ride sharing without Uber. You can have uh, selling books without Amazon. So you get rid of the platforms through these decentralized applications and the heart of those dApps are smart contracts.
now, the highest form of a smart contract is a decentralized autonomous organization. Decentralized autonomous organizations are nothing else than very complex smart contracts that define the bylaws of an organization into the smart contracts. What kind of DAOs have we had so far? And if we look at Bitcoin really is the first decentralized autonomous organizations. It's not only money without banks, but it's also money without bank managers. There is no central Bitcoin authority. There is not one person or one entity who can turn off Bitcoin. Okay, so now let's look at disrupting organizations. So if we look at organizations we know today, whether political or economical, they're very much organized in this hierarchical top-down way. Smart contracts and the protocols that are machine consensus that is auto-enforceable can now define the rules of an organization into auto-enforceable code. And this way, we can get rid of a lot of bureaucracy, whether in private organizations or in public organizations. Even though this technology is in the very early stages, it has the potential to really disrupt the way we organize society. If you look at Bitcoin, it has a market capitalization of more than a lot of small nations out there, and it's completely run decentrally. On the political side, let's look what we had before. We had the kings ruling a dictatorship. is very top-down. And when we started to have democracy, the idea was to allow people to participate in the consensus process. The problem with big societies is that it's inefficient for everyone to take part in every decision-making process. And this is why the forms of democracy that we have nowadays are representative democracy. These institutionalized representative democracies are in a way very hierarchical. We as citizens, we can vote every four years, sometimes every five years, but in between we have very little power over what those representatives do. We cannot revoke that power. We have very limited means in most cases. Now, government entities are trusted third parties in a way. And with blockchain, with machine consensus for the first time, we're in a situation where we could make concepts like liquid democracy on one hand or holacracy on the other hand when it comes to organizations happen in a much more efficient way. Smart contracts or machine consensus is very efficient. When we can exactly predict what will happen, it's easy to, to put that into code and to reduce transaction costs. Smart contract blockchains are really lousy when it comes to dealing with unknown unknowns because we cannot enforce situations as those unknown unknowns. What do we do when those unknown unknowns occur? We need dispute resolution. We need some kind of governance mechanisms that we don't have yet. So I think because the technology is still in the early stages, since we can use it for any kind of use case, let's start with the non-essential and non-critical things because it's still very experimental technology. A lot of use cases of blockchain are built on network effects when it comes to accounting, when it comes to supply chain, Internet of Things, etc. So we're not there yet. For those use cases where we need extreme network effects, we need another five to ten years. And hopefully the first killer application in the next three years. But you can see that even though we all long for a more decentralized world, we have been socialized in very top-down structures in a way. So there is a gap between where we want to be and where we can be as a society because we don't have the soft tools yet.